Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I would like to thank uh, Stoino and all the organizers for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here today. My first time in Sofia in Bulgaria. Uh, so my lab is interested in uh, the response to replication stress in, in yeast and in human cells. And uh, today, uh, because it's a, a chromosome structure meeting, I, I decided to focus mostly on SMC proteins that are best known for their role in uh, chromosome structure. So you're all familiar, I guess, with SMC complexes. Uh, of course, coisin and condensin that are very well known for their role in, in chromosome organization. But also this, this uh, complex called SMC5 and 6, which is better known for its role in DNA repair. But still, we don't quite understand wh what it, it, it does. So it's also uh, referred to by some people as confusing because we still don't understand what it does. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about confusing because it's too confusing. Uh, I, I also wanted to mention that there is an SMC-like complex, uh, the MRN MRX complex. You have heard uh, about it uh, today, um, which is related to SMC proteins because the RAT50 subunit uh, is st structurally related, although it's not as SMC. Uh, complex uh, per se. Okay, so uh, in the lab we got interested in, in what these uh, uh, complexes are doing besides their classical function in chromosome organization, what, what they could be doing at uh, replication forks, especially when replication forks is, is stressed. So uh, some years ago we uh, started a collaboration um, with the, the, the um, uh, with, with a lab in Canada, and uh, the, the point was to see whether these proteins were recruited to store replication forks. So, uh, sorry, the, the lab of Jennifer Cobb, I had a, a blank. Um, so here you have a map of a, a yeast, a part of a yeast chromosome, you have the, the position of replication origins, and in gray you have the position of replicated DNA uh, when replication is stressed with hydroxyurea. And so we located the, the, the position of uh, RAT50 and, and uh, cohesin recruitment at these sites. And you can see that there is a very nice co-localization with arrested folks and uh, both the MRX and the cohesin complex. So uh, this is a, a, a meta gene or meta uh, origin where you have all the early replicating origins in the genome. And you see there is, there is a very nice peak of uh, cohesin and uh, RAT50, so MRX. Uh, precisely at the replicated regions in hydroxyurea. Uh, I'm not going to show you all the data because this is published, but we found that the, the, the recruitment of cohesin was dependent on MRX, and all that was required to form uh, recombination intermediates at stored replication forks. So in the absence of either RAT50 or cohesin, uh, these rec recombination intermediates that are important to restart the forks were, uh, were largely reduced. Okay, so uh, later on we, we tried to figure out the mechanisms of the loading of cohesin that stalled forks. So this is largely the, the work of uh, Armel Langron in the team. She's a, a senior scientist, very talented senior scientist, who, who uh, supervised uh, many students in the lab. So the idea was to, to try to, to follow the kinetics of uh, recruitment of this protein, understand the mechanism. So this is a, a simplified uh, representation of the fork. You, you heard uh, from Stoino that the DNA polymerase is coupled to uh, the replicative heli helicase, CMG. So when the replication fork stalls, uh, of course this is in the context of chromatin. So when the replication fork is rested, uh, uh, M, you, you saw that MRX, uh, MR11, is recruited to the fork. And what we showed in this paper, and this is uh, published, I'm not showing the data, but just giving you the, the take-home message. When MRX is recruited to the fork, uh, somehow, and together with histone modifiers like GCN5 and SET1, it drives the, a remodeling of the nascent chromatin. It makes the, chrom the nucleosome more mobile. And this uh, uh, makes some room for nucleases that now are uh, able to resect nascent DNA. And this is generating a single-stranded DNA at the fork. So this single-stranded DNA is important to signal the replication stress and activate uh, ATR checkpoint. But we showed that it's also important to load cohesin at the stored replication fork. And uh, what is important to say here is that 
uh, uh, MRX is doing that independently of the nuclease activity of MR11. So it's really dependent on the RAT50 subunit and uh, some kind of st structural uh, function of MRX at the fork. So together with Coisin, uh, this allows the, 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 the restart, the HR-mediated restart uh, of the replication. And just to mention also that we published in, the, in another paper that this st uh, structural function of the MRX complex is not only important for the stability of the fork, but it's also organizing the long-range uh, uh, structure of the chromatin in the, in the yeast nucleus. Okay, so now how about condensing? Well, uh, uh, Axel, the student who did the work uh, before, uh, uh, tried to address the same question, looking at the localization of condensing at arrested forks in, in yeast. And what he found is that, again, uh, well, there, obviously there is condensing all over the genome, but if you look specifically at uh, arrested forks uh, near uh, early origins, you see that there is a recruitment that is specific to H arrested cells that we don't see in G1. And then if you align all the early origins, again, you see this pattern of uh, condensing being recruited uh, behind arrested forks. So the question obviously was, what was the function there? So what he did was to use uh, a thermosensitive mutant, FSMC2, uh, which grows a bit more slowly in normal conditions. And then he exposed the cells to hydroxyria, and then he could show that the cells were hypersensitive to, to, uh, uh, to the fork arrest. Okay. Uh, he also used an, the, um, uh, a degrowned version of the SMC4 subunit, and again, he could show that although the cells grow a bit more slowly in the, in the absence of SMC4, uh, uh, you see that they are super uh, sensitive to MMS, so to replication stress. So obviously, uh, condensing is important not only for the uh, condensation of the chromosomes, but to execute some function during the S phase. So what he did also to look more directly at replication is to use a technique called DNA combing, where you can label ongoing replication. So he could show that uh, upon uh, MMS exposure, the forks are arrested. So you label uh, a track that is about 20 kb long. So no difference between the control cells and the SMC4 depleted cells. But then if you release the cells from the arrest, uh, you see that there is a very significant delay in, in the, or the, there are shorter tracks, so mean, meaning that there is a delay in fork restart that can be uh, fully uh, rescued by re-expressing the wild type SMC4. Okay, so looks like there is a problem in restarting the fork in the absence of condensing. The problem in yeast is that uh, there is only one uh, condensing. Uh, it's essential for life, and uh, it's very difficult to separate what is related to some. Uh, S-phase specific function to what is related to what is happening later on in G2 and mitosis, okay? So we decided to, to switch to human cells, and this is again the work of Armel, but together with another PhD student, <laughs> Megan Damota. So Megan took advantage of the fact that there are two uh, types of condensing in human cells, condensing one and two, and we knew from the work of Tatsuya Irano that uh, although both condensing one and two bind chromosomes in, in metaphase, uh, in interphase it's different. You see that condensing one is excluded from the nucleus, whereas condensing two is detected uh, on chromatin uh, in interphase. Okay. Uh, so she tried to address the, the difference between condensing one and condensing two, and she could show that especially when she depletes condensing 2, CAPG2, this subunit, uh, this synthesizes the cells to hydroxyria, okay? Uh, she also used a technique called uh, PLA, proximity ligation assay, to detect, to see whether condensing 2 was recruited to replication forks, and she could see that in, indeed uh, there are uh, uh, foci that form uh, uh, in the presence of, uh, hydro especially in the presence of hydroxyria, which are indicative of a, a close localization of condensing to and uh, uh, ongoing uh, replication sites, so EDU incorporation sites. So to go a bit further, we use the DNA fiber uh, spreading assay, 
so basically, we label uh, ongoing replication with IDU and CLDU. Then we uh, purify the DNA, stre stretch it on, on cover sleeves, on, on slides, sorry. And then we detect the uh, replicated parts uh, with specific antibodies. So what the first thing we did was to measure the speed of replication forks in the absence of condensin 1 and condensin 2. And you see, so the speed is basically the, the distance that the fork is going to cover uh, within the, the, the length of the pulse. And you see that there is no difference between the depleted cells. So uh, none of the two condensing uh, subunits are important for replication fork speed. Okay. Then we looked at stalled replication forks after uh, hydroxyurea addition. And what we did was to measure uh, the, the resection of nascent DNA. So basically, uh, when the cells are, are labeled with IDU and CLDU, uh, if you, in the absence of drugs, if you measure the length, the ratio of the two uh, tracks is, should be close to one, so meaning there is no resection. But now if you expose the cells to hydroxyurea, you see that in control cells, there is a shortening. The ratio is, is smaller, so it means that there is a shortening of the second track, meaning that the, the nascent DNA is degraded upon fork rest. And now you can see that if we deplete condensin 1, there is no difference. But if we deplete condensin 2, now the, the resection is completely lost. So showing that condensin 2 is required for uh, fork resection once the fork is arrested with hydroxyurea. So how does it work? Well, uh, you know that when fork progresses, just like when transcription is progressing, uh, there is accumulation of positive supercoiling in front of the fork. And this is a problem, and uh, this has to be uh, relaxed by topoisomerase 1. Now, there is another way of relaxing positive supercoiling, which is to, to let the fork rotate. So this is creating catenanes that are eventually removed by top 2 to allow chromosome uh, segregation. Okay. Now, wh what happens when the fork is stalling? Especially when replication and transcription converge, there is accumulation of positive supercoiling. And even in the presence of top 1, this is posing the fork. But especially when top 1 is inhibited, like if cells are treated with uh, camptotisin, then uh, uh, the lab of uh, Massimo Lopez has shown that uh, there is what we call a fork reversal, which means that the nascent DNA is uh, reannealing, and, and this is forming this, this four-way junction, so it looks like a chicken foot. And we know that most of the resection that occurs at stored replication forks is taking place at these reverse forks. And this is, uh, and this is the work of many labs showing that this is a process that is tightly controlled by BRCA2 and RAT51, uh, which prevent the, the hyper-resection of this nascent DNA. So in other words, the, a little bit of resection is important to promote fork restart and activate the checkpoint, but too much resection is, is bad and it's toxic in the absence of BRCA2. Okay, uh, now, uh, since these uh, papers, um, many labs worked on, the, on this uh, fork reversal process. And there's a very nice paper from the, the lab of David Cortes that uh, came out recently in science, where he went a bit further into the characterization of the mechanism. And what he could show is that uh, upon fork arrest, to allow the fork reversal, you, you first need to remove the, the DNA polymerases. Then this allows the loading of RAT51 on, the, on, on parental DNA. And, and then you have a RAT51 annealing of the parental DNA that uh, is important for two things. Uh, the first thing is that it will drive the fork reversal, but the, the other thing is that it will trap the CMG helicase on the DNA. And this is very important for fork restart because uh, the CMG helicase can be only loaded on DNA in G1. And it's very important not to lose it into S phase because otherwise you can't restart uh, the fork. Okay, now on the, on the fork reversal side, uh, this is also creating a substrate for DNA translocases like SMARCAL1. And SMARCAL1 will then drive further the fork reversal to get uh, a full extension of the reversal and, and the resection of nascent DNA. Now, uh, this, this process of fork reversal also needs to unwind the parental DNA and the replicated DNA, so which means that there is also accumulation of supercoiling, positive supercoiling behind the fork. 
And, and the paper, a very nice paper came out from a, a Chinese group uh, two years ago where they showed that top two is required to uh, relax this positive supercoiling in order to have a full extension of the fork reversal. Okay. And they showed by electron microscopy that if you deplete top two, then you get a very limited fork reversal with just a little bit of uh, extension uh, going on. So this is very tricky to do this EM data. So we, we decided to use uh, the fork resection as a readout for fork, for fork reversal because you need re the, to reverse the fork to resect it. So we reproduce their data and in, indeed we find that uh, in control cells we get fork resection uh, 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 in the presence of HU. If we deplete Markal1, the, the, the translocase will prevent this fork resection because you have no reversal. If we deplete top 2A, again, we have no uh, fork resection, as they predicted from their paper. And if we deplete both, you see that there is a slight rescue, but not very significant. Now, how about condensing? Well, with condensing, we get exactly the same results. So if we, uh, again, control cells resection, without SMACAL1, no resection, without condensing two, uh, again, uh, no resection, and if we combine smart cal one and cap G2, you see that now we, we get some kind of a, a rescue. So this is just a quantitation of the data I just showed you. So you see that uh, smart cal one and top two or smart cal one and cap G2 are both required for the fork resection. But if we remove both of them, now we restore the resection largely. So how does it work? Well, uh, we have a model. I don't know if it's correct or not, but we are working on it. So the model is based on, on the, the data from the Decker lab, uh, proposing that when there are uh, plectonemic structures uh, forming on DNA, uh, condensin is able to detect these structures and then to induce the, the, this uh, loop extrusion and, and, and uh, convert all these uh, small plectonemes into a big one, okay? Uh, so what we think that is going on at stalled fork is exactly the same mechanism. You have positive supercoiling accumulating when you do the reversal, and condensing too uh, potentially could bind to these structures and, and create a bigger structure that now can be optimally processed by uh, topoisome rays too. So uh, what we think also is that this structure is, is both required to drive the resection, but if uh, SMARCAL1 is not there, it doesn't work. Uh, but if we remove both SMARCAL1 and condensing two, we release this loop and, and somehow we can manage to get some uh, extent of fork resection and, and fork reversal. And we've, I'm not going, I don't have time to show you the data, but especially if we block topoisome rays one, uh, we show that the positive supercoiling that is here is actually pushing and, and driving the fork reversal if SMARCAL1 is not there, especially when condensing two is not there either, okay? So uh, finally, uh, uh, this raises another question, that is, uh, if condensing two binds to supercoiled DNA behind the fork, and I remind you that there is also supercoiled DNA in front of the fork, what prevents condensing two from driving uh, condensation, uh, even more condensation, and these structures uh, in front of the fork? And this is, uh, this is a problem because if you uh, induce a premature condensation on unreplicated DNA, uh, this is uh, something that uh, is causing uh, genomic instability and a lot of problems, okay? So we know that there is a protein called MCPH1, microcephalin, that is uh, preventing condensing 2 from acting uh, uh, before, uh, before G2 or before mitosis. So, uh, but how does microcephalin discriminate between this kind of condensation that would be toxic from this kind of condensation that is required to drive fork restart. Well, we looked into the, more closely into this protein. So it's a very interesting protein because it's also called BRIT1 because it's mutated in breast cancer and it's associated to DNA damage and genomic instability. And actually the protein has, has multiple domains. This part of the protein is important to regulate condensation and this part of the protein is, in, is important to uh, regulate the DNA damage response. And especially it's interacting with gamma H2X and, and with BRCA2. So we looked at the localization of MCPH1 using this PLA assay. And we found that again, it co-localizes with EDU, so with replication sites. So we wanted to separate these two functions. 
And we took advantage at, to the, of the fact that there is an isoform of MCPH1, it's a natural isoform that is expressed in all cells, that doesn't have the, the domain that interacts with BRCA2 and, and gamma H2X. So we use siRNA to either deplete the, the, the protein completely. So we, with this siRNA, we deplete the both of the form. But with this one, we only deplete the long one. So we keep the small one. So if we look at the, uh, this uh, uh, premature condensation uh, uh, phenotype, you see that when there is no uh, MCPH1 at all, there is a very strong uh, PCC phenotype. But if we either express the short isoform, we keep the short isoform, or we deplete condensing 2, then we remove completely this PCC phenotype, okay? Which, which makes sense and explains and, and, and validates the, the approach. So now we measure the fork speed. We, we notice that just like condensing 2, there is no effect of either the full length or the short isoform uh, depletion in the for, for replication fork speed, so it's uh, not required. But what we found is that when we look at fork resection, now we have a very different uh, phenotype. So you see that when we deplete, uh, um, when we uh, expose normal cells to I2, you see that there is this resection that I showed you again before. Uh, now if we deplete MCPH1, we get even more resection. So we get a kind of hyper-resection phenotype that is very similar to what was reported when BRCA2 is mutated. So we tried to uh, combine uh, the BRCA2 and MCPH1 depletion, and you see that, again, uh, BRCA2 depletion, uh, we get this hyper-resection, and if we deplete both of the protein, then we, when we get this hyper-resection again, okay? So finally, we combine it with uh, the SMARCAL1, the, 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 the uh, translocase that is required to drive the fork resection. And you see that we can restore uh, uh, at least partially the, the, the phenotype by removing SMARCAL1. So it means that, again, it's, it's related to, to fork reversal. So this is the, the final model. Uh, so what we propose is that, uh, as I told you, condensing 2 but not condensing 1 has a specific function in S phase, which is to uh, drive uh, to facilitate fork reversal by acting together with topoisome RAS2. And we, and we propose that uh, MCPH1 is, is a key regulator of this function, and it's important to prevent uh, condensation from occurring at other sites that have not been replicated yet. And, and we, we've, we found that uh, MCPH1 and BRCA2 are, are working together to prevent the, the hyper-resection of uh, the, the reverse fork. So, so altogether, the, these, these proteins are ensuring that the cells are, are controlling uh, the, the extent of fork reversal and fork resection to promote fork restart upon uh, fork arrest. Okay, uh, I will stop here just to thank the, the people who, who did the work. So, uh, as I told you, most of the, the work on condensing and cohesin was uh, supervised by Armel Langron together with uh, uh, Megan Damota and Axel, who is now uh, in the, at the Sloan Catering. And, and the work on MCPH1 was largely done by, by Dia Gopal, a, a postdoc, and, and Yalilin, a staff scientist in the lab. And uh, I thank you for your attention. I will take questions if you have any. Uh, so, I, this, uh, it's very interesting about the function of TOPO2 in, in the interface. I wonder what's known about the turnover rate. Is, is condensing 2 turning over during the interface? Because I was under the impression that it's largely bound to DNA and stays bound uh, during the interface. And the other question is what's known about its activity? Because this model assumes that condensing 2 has loop extrusion activity during the interface. Uh, I was under also kind of the, 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 the fork is that it's inactivated during the end exit from my test, but what's known about this? Well, yeah, we, 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 can't, we can't tell that. I mean, it was supposed to be inactive because uh, condensation in interface was supposed to be toxic. But at least we have here one case where this activity is required. So the question is, of course, wh why is it restricted to these events taking place behind the fork and, and how is it prevented from condensing elsewhere? So 
We don't have the, the answer yet, but uh, it looks like MCPH1 is involved in the, in the regulation. Yeah. Did, did, did people try frapping or doing iFlip? No, no, no. We have, we What's haven't. the turnover? Because this, this model also assumes that it can unbind and bind to the super super coiled yes, regions. Yes, yes, I agree. So it would be interesting. So, so what, what is interesting, uh, what, what is different between uh, uh, condensing two and top two is that uh, if you have condensing two bound to these structures, then it will be uh, also, it will also prevent the fork reversal if you don't have small one, which is not mm -hmm. the case for, for top two. So it seems that one is, once it's there, it's, 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 it's pretty stable, but to, I agree, we have to test it directly, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. using FRAP. Any other question? How exactly the condensant to bind to the displectonins? That's what, that's based, I think, where maybe is coming, it's hard to visualize. That I think what yeah. the concern yeah. is. Yeah, we have no, no idea whatsoever. The, well, the only thing we can say is that condensing 2 is binding MCPH1, and MCPH1 binds BRCA2, which is recruited at, at these reverse forks. So it could be that it's targeted there through this interaction with these uh, fork-associated factors. But besides the PLA experiments, which are a bit indirect, we, we have no idea. We have to go maybe more into the dependency. Like if we deplete BRCA2, do we lose the, the recruitment of uh, condensing? Or is it just going there by, you know, in a non-specific manner? I think we have the tools to, to go further into the characterization of the, the mechanism. And what's happening during mitosis? Well, I guess during mitosis, it's, uh, I mean, these structures that we, 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 we detect in S phase are supposed to be resolved uh, uh, before you get into mitosis. So I assume that then in mitosis, it's a normal process that is taking place. Uh, you have condensation all over the genome, yeah. Maybe uh, I'm making a mistake, but uh, so you have a DNA repair to perform when you have the forks starting. So you have to look for the, the homolog to repair, and then, the, then the, what would be, if, if the role of condensin or other coisin uh, involved in finding the, uh, the homologue to repair also uh, could explain at least partially uh, the story. Yeah, uh, I, I, I totally agree for cohesin that it is important to keep the sister chromatids together. But we, we believe that condensin is, is acting uh, upstream of that uh, because it's, it's so, the, the picture that is now, the consensus now in the replication field is that as soon as you have something uh, interfering in fork progression, you have this fork rever reversion, reversal that takes place. It's like, a, it's like a handbrake in the car when you have the, the fork posing to stabilize the, the fork and, 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 and signal okay. the stress, you have this fork reversal. So, so we think that condensing is important to drive the fork reversal and then cohesin is acting later if there is a break, to ensure that the break will use the sister chromatid mm. as a template. It's probably like, two different like uh, mechanisms. Yeah. 